The 1970s proved to be a turbulent decade for America, as social unrest and the war in Vietnam continue to take a toll on the morale and the economy. President Richard Nixon's desire to see NASA reduce their budget after the costliness of the Apollo program results in a cancellation of Apollo missions 18 through 20. Man's space travel is ending as far as travel to the moon goes. The 70s will see NASA reinvent itself and rise from the ashes of Apollo on the wings of a new mode of space travel, the Space Shuttle. These are the further tribulations, sacrifices, and victories as man travels amongst the stars. To prehistoric man, the open sky is more than just open space. It is the home of the gods. Around 3500 BC, Babylonian King Atena is portrayed as flying on an eagle's back on his journey to seek the counsel of the god Anu. Ancient Greece develops the myth of the architect Daedalus and his son Icarus. Trapped in a high tower, Daedalus crafts wings made of wax and feathers as a means of escape. Daedalus gives his son Icarus one warning. Do not fly too close to the sun. Enraptured and giddy by his flight, Icarus soars too closely to the sun, itself the symbol of the god Apollo. His wings melt to nothing and he falls to his death in the ocean below. Daedalus is forced to fly on alone, lest he suffer his own son's fate. The ancient Chinese do manage to bring themselves close to heaven with the invention of the kite in 1000 BC. Often made of bamboo and silk, it harnesses the wind for everything from festive decorum to acting as a signal. In 559 BC, a prince named Yuan Huangtao, held prisoner by the emperor, survives a forced flight in an owl-like paper kite. He is the only royal prisoner to do so. The English Franciscan philosopher and cleric, Roger Bacon, goes beyond harnessing the wind. In 1250 AD, he first writes about creating a balloon of thin copper and filling it with liquid fire as a means of rising into the air. He also, in the hope of emulating birds, studies creating a flying machine with flapping wings. During the Italian Renaissance, between 1485 to 1500, Leonardo da Vinci envisions and designs a flying machine. Laying flat, 
the pilot operates flapping, bat-like wings. This ornithopter will haunt would-be aviators for centuries to come. It is not air currents that allow man to finally soar, but hot air. On August 8, 1709, Lisbon-based Portuguese priest Bartolomeu Lorenzo de Guzmão successfully demonstrates a small hot air balloon to the court of King John V. French brothers Joseph Ralph and Jacques Etienne Moncoffier take Bartholomew's demonstration a little further. On September 19, 1783, they successfully fly in a hot air balloon for 10 minutes. A tethered flight with a human is performed on October 15th by Etienne de Moncoffier and then one by Pilatre de Rosier. De Rosier and Marquis François de Lande successfully petitioned King Louis XVI to become the first humans to travel free and untethered in a hot air balloon. They float away on November 21, 1783. Eleven years later, during the June 26, 1794 Battle of Fleurus, the French observed the field of battle from the safety of a hot air balloon. This new means of flight is soon embraced the world over. Balloonist Thaddeus C. Lowe meets with President Lincoln on June 11, 1861 to demonstrate the importance and power of aerial reconnaissance. His hydrogen-filled observation balloon, the Enterprise, floats across the street from the White House. With a telegraph wire stretched from balloon basket to the War Department, Lowe sends a groundbreaking message to President Lincoln. I have pleasure in sending you this first dispatch ever telegraphed from an aerial station and in acknowledging indebtedness to your encouragement for the opportunity of demonstrating the availability of the science of aeronautics in the service of the country. For Lincoln, the hot air balloon will prove advantageous in the civil war between the states. Lowe and an officer float over enemy lines at the first battle of Bull Run to draw topographical maps. This act earns Lowe the title of Chief Aeronaut of the newly formed Union Army Balloon Corps and will come hard-earned by the descent of the Enterprise's maiden voyage. Bull Run is the first of many times hot air balloons will be used in aerial surveillance during the war. The war between the states ends on April 9, 1865, with the surrender of Confederate General Robert E. Lee in Appomattox, Virginia. The Civil War is just the start of extending the field of battle to the heavens. Over in France that same year, author Jules Gabriel Verne pens the story of American gun enthusiasts, the Baltimore Gun Club, who dream of reaching the moon the only way that they can imagine. They build a giant cannon and bullet-like craft with which to escape Earth's gravity and, at the book's end, successfully reach the stars. The book is entitled From the Earth to the Moon, and it's only the start of Verne's otherworldly musings. Verne continues the story five years later with Around the Moon, which will have a second life beyond the printed page. Indeed, nothing could equal the splendor of this starry world bathed in limpid ether. Its diamonds set in the heavenly vault 
sparkled magnificently. The eye took in the firmament from the Southern Cross to the North Star, those two constellations which in 12,000 years, by reason of the succession of equinoxes, will resign their part of the polar stars, the one to Onapus in the Southern Hemisphere, the other to Vega in the Northern. Imagination loses itself in this sublime infinity amid which the projectile was gravitating, like a new star created by the hand of man. From a natural cause, these constellations shone with a soft luster. They did not twinkle, for there was no atmosphere which, by the intervention of its layers, unequally dense and of different degrees of humidity, produces the scintillation. These stars were soft eyes looking out into the dark night amid the silence of absolute space. Over in Prussia, engineer Otto Lilienthal begins his own studies into the principles of manned flight. In 1889, he publishes his book, Bird Flight as the Basis of Aviation. And two years later, he successfully begins test flying gliders while still designing monoplanes and biplanes. In 1895, Lilienthal embarks on his first biplane glider flight. While successful, he dies the next year when his neck is broken during a flight. He has logged 2,000 flights for a total of flight time of five hours. Meanwhile, the airship, or dirigible, is being developed as a mechanized means of air travel. Using the hot air balloon and pairing it with a propulsion system, Hopes are that the airship will become as common as horse-drawn carriages. Early versions employ everything from steam power to coal power and even hand-turned propellers. Mankind still dreams of breaking through the atmosphere to reach greater heights. Amongst these dreamers is the English author H.G. Wells. A writer of fantastic stories, much like Verne's, Wells will go down as one of the fathers of a new genre that focuses on the fantastic and seemingly impossible. Verne's 1901 book, The First Men in the Moon, follows the adventures of a London businessman, Mr. Bedford, and a crackpot scientist, Mr. Cavour, on their quest to reach the moon. Using a ship made of fictitious anti-gravitational elements, they leave the Earth and experience weightlessness beyond its atmosphere. He pointed to the loose cases and bundles that had been lying on the blankets in the bottom of the sphere. I was astonished to see that they were floating now nearly a foot from the spherical wall. Then I saw from his shadow that Cavour was no longer leaning against the glass. I thrust out my hand behind me and found that I too was suspended in space, clear of the glass. When they arrive on the moon, they encounter a race of aliens named Selenites. By story's end, Cavour stays on the moon with its people, but is forbidden to make transmissions to Earth when the Selenites learn of man's propensity for war. Filmmaker Georges Méliès will take the works of both Wells and Verne and bring them to life in an early silent film. A magician, Méliès latches on to the new medium of film to create magical illusions on the motion picture screen. Referred to as a cinemagician, Méliès is the pioneer of special effects. His masterpiece, A Trip to the Moon, stars Melies as Professor Babinfuyis, president of the Astronomic Club, who convinces his club members to build a space capsule. The bullet-like capsule, launched from a cannon, pierces the right eye of the man on the moon. Facing the Selenites, 
the scientists managed to push their capsule off the edge of the moon, down through space, and into an ocean on Earth, where they are rescued and given a hero's welcome. The film borrows much from Jules Verne's From the Earth to the Moon and Around the Moon. A trip to the moon is a worldwide success. Melies' pioneering of special effects makes it an unprecedented spectacle and one that audiences frequently indulge in. Over a hundred years later, its images remain iconic. The Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo space programs resulted in wasted spacecraft components viewed as an expense to the budget-conscious Nixon administration. As Apollo comes to a close, NASA seeks a solution that will be reusable and, by nature, much more cost-efficient. The Department of Defense and Air Force, along with NASA, had been exploring and developing the concept of a reusable space plane since the 1950s. But it is actually NASA's goal of an orbital space station and the subsequent need of astronaut transport to and from that necessitates the creation of an actual space shuttle. This space shuttle will also help with satellite launch, maintenance, and retrieval, delivery of supplies to a space station, and it will also carry regular orbital missions. This, the United States' first space station, will be called Skylab. May 14, 1973. A Saturn V roars to life on the Kennedy Space Center launch pad. Rather than bearing a space capsule, it carries the first space station, converted from a Saturn IV-B rocket. Concealed in a shroud at the Saturn V's tip, much like the Apollo modules, is Skylab. Once it reaches orbit and the shroud casing falls away, solar panels will extend along with a protective micrometeoroid shield. Skylab reaches orbit and the shield tears off. The solar array is damaged. The Soviet space station, Salyut 1, lost its three cosmonauts during their return flight on June 30th, 1971. Skylab, hopefully, will not suffer a similar fate. The second Skylab launch boasts Gemini and Apollo veteran Pete Conrad, Joseph Kerwin, and Paul Weitz. When the docking latches into Skylab fail to work, the astronauts know that they have their work cut out for them. But by the end of their 26 and a half day mission, Skylab is operational. Skylab features laboratories, a workshop, and individual crew quarters. Two more crews will fly to Skylab for missions of 59 and 84 days. On February 8, 1974, the last astronauts leave the U.S.'s first space station. They leave the door unlocked for future visitors. Things aren't as calm on Earth as they are in space. President Richard Nixon amidst investigations into the Watergate break-in, resigns the presidency. Just nine months prior, Vice President Spiro Agnew had himself been forced to resign under charges of bribery and tax evasion. To continue to fight through the months ahead for my personal vindication would almost totally absorb the time and attention of both the president and the Congress in a period when our entire focus should be on the great issues of peace abroad and prosperity without inflation at home. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Vice President Ford will be sworn in as president at that hour in this office. House Speaker Gerald Ford finds himself ascending to the Vice Presidency and then to the Presidency itself. 
He is sworn in as the 38th President of the United States. I am acutely aware that you have not elected me as your president by your ballots. So I ask you to confirm me as your president with your prayers. And I hope that such prayers will also be the first of many. If you have not chosen me by secret ballot, neither have I gained office by any secret promises. I have not campaigned either for the presidency or the vice presidency. And so, the United States of America continues its struggle. Space travel does, however, succeed in building diplomatic inroads between the U.S. and former space rival, the USSR. The Apollo Soyuz test project brings two astronauts in an Apollo capsule together with two Soviet cosmonauts in their ship, the Soyuz. July 15, 1975, 8.20 a.m. Eastern. Cosmonaut Alexei Leonov, the first man to ever perform a spacewalk, and Valery Kubasov lift off. They will place themselves in orbit and then meet up with their American counterparts. July 15, 1975, 3.50 p.m. Eastern. Aboard NASA's Apollo craft are Thomas Stafford, Vance Brand, and a special passenger. Deke Slayton. Finally cleared from any health concerns, Slayton has waited years for the chance to reach the wonders of outer space. Two days later, the ships successfully dock. At 3.17 p.m., the hatch between the ships opens and Stafford and Leonov share an historic handshake. Soviet General Secretary Leonid Brezhnev and U.S. President Ford each transmit messages to the space explorers. Astronauts and cosmonauts spend 44 hours together in the makeshift space station where they perform experiments, speak each other's language, and cement the relations between the two nations. Apollo Soyuz is an historic coming together that marks the end of the space race and a beginning of an era of cooperation. It is also a final and bittersweet send-off to the Apollo program, as the space shuttle program looms large in its place. For Deke Slayton, the thought of reaching space in his 50s seemed an impossibility in the years before. But he has finally achieved his dream. May 25th, 1977, a young filmmaker by the name of George Lucas achieves his own dream. Star Wars, Lucas's space opera, is released to movie theaters everywhere. While science fiction films had not been held in high esteem for some time, the mythic resonance of Lucas's world, the operatic score by John Williams, and the cutting-edge special effects by Lucas's own industrial light and magic, makes Star Wars a landmark in both film and culture. It launches a film series that still runs strong today and generates an excitement about space fantasy. After Star Wars' success, more science fiction follows. Travel amongst the stars is once more a lofty dream. Meanwhile, the American political landscape continues to shift. Jimmy Carter, a Georgia state senator, becomes the 39th president in 1977 and only serves one term. Also in 1977, two unmanned space probes, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, are launched by NASA to continue throughout the solar system Aboard both probes are a golden record. It is made of gold-plated copper. These phonograph records contain images and sounds of Earth, a cosmic message in a bottle for any civilization who may encounter it. 
1976. Meanwhile, NASA continues to develop their new space shuttle amidst budgetary concerns from the White House. It is decided that a space shuttle should have a large cargo bay to carry payloads to space and will best be served as a delta wing orbiter. The thermal protection system that can withstand temperatures of up to 2,910 degrees Fahrenheit will keep the shuttle cool enough for the heat of re-entry. This shuttle will launch vertically through assist by a large external tank loaded with a liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen fuel, as well as two flanking booster rockets. The contractor, North American Rockwell, starts building the shuttle on June 4, 1974. It goes by the name Orbiting Vehicle 101, or OV-101, but it will soon gain another name. A letter-writing campaign to President Ford by fans of the TV show Star Trek, off the air since 1969, urges the OV-101 to be rechristened after the fictional spaceship commanded by William Shatner's Captain Kirk. The first space shuttle is given a name reflective of the utopian culture at play in Star Trek, one where racial and social boundaries do not exist, and people of all races and nationalities happily live and work together for the betterment of man. This science fiction projection of the perfect society one that is past the turmoil of the present-day real-world one, is perfectly encapsulated in the name, the Enterprise. The Enterprise is not intended for orbital flight, but rather for earthbound flight tests. With testing starting in 1977, the Enterprise is retired for the first fully functional orbital space shuttle to take its place. It is named Columbia. Ronald Reagan, the governor of California and former actor, takes office in 1981. A mere 69 days into his first term, he is met with tragedy when leaving a speaking engagement. It is March 30, 1981, at 2.27 p.m. As Reagan leaves the Washington Hilton Hotel, he has only 30 feet to walk between service exit to his limousine. John Hinckley Jr., a mentally ill man, empties six shots from a Rome RG-14 revolver. White House Press Secretary James Brady is shot in the head. Police officer Thomas Delahanty is hit in the back of his neck. As Hinckley fires, he misses and hits a building window. And then Special Agent Jeremy Parr, the fifth bullet, shatters the bulletproof glass of the presidential limo, but the sixth bullet ricochets off the limo and gets President Reagan in the left underarm. The bullet grazes his rib and lodges in his lung. It stops a mere inch from the president's heart. Ronald Reagan will live, but Brady will be left paralyzed and eventually dies from long-term effects caused by the bullet. April 12th, 1981, 7 a.m. Astronauts John Young and Robert Cripp Crippen sit in the Columbia on its launch pad at Cape Kennedy. President Reagan, freshly back from recovery, will watch the launch from his Lincoln bedroom in the White House. Unlike the earlier NASA programs, the space shuttle does not receive an unmanned test flight. This complex vehicle surpasses anything that has come before. As Young and Crippen await countdown, they also await the chance to activate Columbia's powerful three rocket boosters, along with the twin solid rocket boosters flanking the side of the added tank. Columbia thunders up and off the launch pad at full power. After about a minute, it reaches 33,600 feet and the engines are cut back to 75%. One minute later, the solid rocket boosters fall off the orbiter and parachutes deployed, splash down for retrieval in the ocean with reuse in mind. 
Around eight minutes later, main engine cutoff happens, and the external tank drops off shortly thereafter, where it breaks up in the atmosphere. The orbital maneuvering system thrusters briefly fire up to ensure proper trajectory, and the space shuttle reaches orbit. Once in space, the Columbia will use any combination of its 46 rocket boosters placed around the shuttle itself to maneuver. Young and Crippen's flight lasts for just over two days before they re-enter Earth's atmosphere, and then they direct Columbia to runway 23 at Edwards Air Force Base in California. The age of the space shuttle has begun. April 4, 1983, 1.30 p.m. The second space shuttle started life as a shuttle mock-up for testing purposes and is overhauled and completed as a fully functional shuttle. The first Challenger crew are Commander Paul Weitz, Pilot Carol Bubko, and Mission Specialists Donald Peterson and Story Musgrave. June 18, 1983, 7.33 a.m. When Challenger leaves the launch pad at Kennedy Space Center for its second flight, it has an historical member amongst its crew, Stanford University doctoral student Sally Ride answers an ad in the newspaper to become an astronaut. By the time she makes the final cut the next year, she has finished her studies and earned her PhD. Dr. Sally Ride will become the first female astronaut. During her intensive training, she learns to not only fly a jet plane, but also shifts into the realm of engineering to help develop a robotic arm. Crip Crippen, one of the pilots on the first space shuttle flight, selects her on this basis. The very private and reserved Dr. Ride has other challenges, however, that of the chauvinism of the 1980s. After having to feel questions hinged on her gender, Ride eventually states in a press conference that it's too bad this is such a big deal. It's too bad our society isn't further along. That first Challenger flight is not a token flight for the young astronaut, but the beginning of what will be a rich and pioneering career in science and education. Challenger's next flight features mission specialist Dr. Guyon Guy Bluford, the first African-American in space. Dr. Bluford received a degree in aerospace engineering from Penn State in 1964 before flying 144 combat missions in Vietnam for the Air Force. Post-Vietnam, Bluford pursued both a master's and a PhD in aerospace engineering at the Air Force Institute of Technology. When NASA gets him in 1979, he brings a level of experience on par with, if not exceeding, those of most NASA astronauts. November 28, 1983, 11 a.m. Space Lab is a reusable and modular laboratory system designed to fit into a space shuttle's cargo hold that can be adapted for a variety of missions and experiments. It will fly on 22 shuttle missions and give scientists further insights to the effect of space and zero gravity. When Discovery takes off for its fourth flight, it boasts a payload specialist among its crew. Senator Jake Garn from Utah becomes the first politician to fly aboard a space shuttle. Garn has logged 10,000 hours as a pilot through service in both the National Guard and the Navy. Garn offers himself up as a guinea pig for motion sickness tests. It will be an intensive 167 hours of his life. Space adaptation sickness is much like car sickness, but it is intensified by having a greater area to free float in in zero G. The level of Garn's space sickness is so great that NASA informally names a scale after him, 
the Garn Scale. Columbia does come close to tragedy upon landing, however. The shuttle brakes are damaged and a tire is blown. It is Commander Bobco's quick thinking and skill that saves the crew from potential disaster. On August 27, 1984, as President Ronald Reagan is preparing for the November elections, he announces the Teacher in Space project. One teacher will be selected to fly into space as a payload specialist and will teach through live broadcast from the space shuttle itself. On July 19, 1985, Vice President George Bush announces the winner, Krista McAuliffe. This 37-year-old social studies teacher is from Concord High School in New Hampshire. It is McAuliffe's enthusiasm and personal energy that helps her win the lauded prize, and perhaps her grace that helps her win the public over. This monumental flight is commanded by Dick Scobie, piloted by Michael Smith, with mission specialists Ellison Onizuka, Judith Resnick, and Ronald McNair. Gregory Jarvis and McAuliffe are the payload specialists. Their mission will include satellite deployment, observation of Halley's Comet, and McAuliffe's lessons for the children below on Earth. January 28, 1986. 11.38 a.m. Eastern Standard. The Kennedy Space Center experiences freakish winter weather on the morning of the launch. Ice encases and covers everything. The Challenger launches, but 73 seconds later, everything changes. Challenger's explosion leaves little hope for the crew's survival. 17% of the American population is calculated as seeing the live feed. Many school children, because of McAuliffe's presence, undoubtedly see it at the school assemblies. That evening, as NASA tries to figure out the cause of the explosion, President Reagan does his best. Today is a day for mourning and remembering. Nancy and I are pained to the core by the tragedy of the shuttle Challenger. We know we share this pain with all of the people of our country. This is truly a national loss. Nineteen years ago, almost to the day, we lost three astronauts in a terrible accident on the ground. But we've never lost an astronaut in flight. We've never had a tragedy like this. And perhaps we've forgotten the courage it took for the crew of the shuttle. But they, the Challenger 7, were aware of the dangers, but overcame them and did their jobs brilliantly. We mourn seven heroes, Michael Smith, Dick Scobie, Judith Resnick, Ronald McNair, Ellison Onizuka, Gregory Jarvis, and Krista Mikulov. We mourn their loss as a nation together. To the families of the seven, we cannot bear as you do the full impact of this tragedy. But we feel the loss, and we're thinking about you so very much. Your loved ones were daring and brave, and they had that special grace, that special spirit that says, give me a challenge, and I'll meet it with joy. They had a hunger to explore the universe and discover its truths. They wished to serve, and they did. They served all of us. We've grown used to wonders in this century. It's hard to dazzle us. But for 25 years, the United States space program has been doing just that. We've grown used to the idea of space, and perhaps we forget that we've only just begun. We're still pioneers. They, the members of the Challenger crew, were pioneers. And I want to say something to the school children of America who were watching the live coverage of the shuttle's takeoff. I know it's hard to understand, but sometimes painful things like this happen. It's all part of the process of exploration and discovery. It's all part of taking a chance and expanding man's horizons. The future doesn't belong to the faint-hearted. It belongs to the brave. The Challenger crew was pulling us into the future, and we'll continue to follow them.
NASA searches the ocean for remains in order to best reconstruct the tragedy and to ascertain its cause. 33 aircraft, 22 ships, and six underwater search vessels comb 93,000 square miles of the Atlantic Ocean for the wreckage. They recover only about 50% of the Challenger. The Challenger crew are put to rest on January 31st. President Reagan is there with more words, but these are meant for the survivors. The future is not free. The story of all human progress is one of a struggle against all odds. We learned again that this America, which Abraham Lincoln called the last best hope of man on earth, was built on heroism and noble sacrifice. It was built by men and women like our seven star voyagers, who answered a call beyond duty, who gave more than was expected or required, and who gave it little thought of worldly reward. Today, the frontier is space and the boundaries of human knowledge. Sometimes when we reach for the stars, we fall short, but we must pick ourselves up again and press on despite the pain. Our nation is indeed fortunate that we can still draw on immense reservoirs of courage, character, and fortitude, that we're still blessed with heroes like those of the Space Shuttle Challenger. Video footage of the launch shows smoke puffs coming from partway up the right solid rocket booster. It is leaking out where two rubber O-rings used in sectional assembly meet. With the Challenger in the air, 58 seconds after launch, a plume of flame emanates from the booster as the thrust increases. The leak causes pressure to decrease in the SRB as hydrogen leaks out. 72 seconds later, the right SRB falls away from its place on the external gas tank. It takes just a second later for liquid oxygen to leak alongside the tank. This results in a combustible cloud that engulfs the shuttle and the tank. The vapor cloud conceals the Challenger's breakup. The crew cabin section of the Challenger emerges from the cloud, blown away from the rest of the shuttle. Due to a variety of factors, from the depressurization of the cabin to the 200G impact of it in the ocean, Experts are unable to determine the exact time of death. The low temperatures that January morning caused the O-rings to turn brittle and not expand to seal the joint as required. The U.S. House Committee on Science and Technology investigate the disaster. Through the investigations, documentation arises that shows a history of concerns over the O-ring. At one point, the O-rings gained the extreme listing of Criticality 1. The day before flight, a Thoyakal engineer raises a concern to NASA over the effect that the low temperatures would have in the O-ring itself. Still, NASA moved forward, reeling from the catastrophic loss of the Challenger. Will the nation again be able to look up to the stars? Thank you.